Welcome to lecture 7 in which we're going to talk about vectors. Now hopefully for most of you this is going to be a review and you've met vectors in some math course before this. If you haven't, don't worry, you're going to get everything that you need to know. So we're going to talk about what are vectors, how to write them down in component form, what does that mean, the different notations that might look confusing if you haven't seen them, but really just different ways of writing down the same thing. Um, we're going to look what happens when you have one the same vector, but you use different choices of coordinate systems, and we're going to talk about adding vectors. Okay, so here's fundamentally what a vector is. A vector is a magnitude and a direction together. Like as a whole, this makes a vector. Now, technically speaking, a vector is... So in, in physics, we associate a vector with certain physical quantities. I'll give you a bunch of examples in a second. We've already met displacement vectors, velocity vectors, and so on. Um, but mathematically speaking, the vector is an abstract object, right? It is defined in terms of magnitude and direction, um, but it sort of lives in its own mathematical space called a vector space. So it doesn't, you don't find a vector lying around um, on the ground, or even if I say, okay, these two points here, right, I'm going to connect them with an arrow, here's my vector, well, you've represented a certain vector, if I do the same thing down here, and if I could draw it exactly in, you know, in the identical way, then those two would not be two different vectors, one living up here, one living down there, they just happen to be equal in some sense, no, no, they're one and the same single vector. This is getting into the math a little bit, um, you know, how to define it properly, but remember they don't live in the physical space, right? So we can draw them as, you know, displacement vector that that corresponds to the displacement from this point to this point, but the vector itself doesn't like live in this space between the two points. It's an abstract mathematical entity that represents the displacement little bit abstract um, but maybe we'll come back to this down the line and if you take more advanced courses in physics or math you'll definitely um, have to start thinking about vectors in a, in a slightly more abstract sense but for our purposes they're essentially representation of physical quantities that have a magnitude and a direction right. and what's crucial what I already hinted at is the same vector can be represented in different ways and still be the same vector so this thing here is is an arrow that I've drawn that represents a vector. I could have written down some numbers instead to tell you what the vector is, right? So again, the vector is this thing in itself, um, but we can represent it in different ways that are useful. Now, they are indeed everywhere in physics, those types of vectors. Okay, I've already met those two, probably this one too a little bit. Displacement, velocity, acceleration vectors. Um, all things that have a magnitude, how far has something been displaced and in what direction and that direction right how quickly is something going and in what direction how what's the rate of acceleration of something and in what direction right these things they require direction to be be a complete specification of you know displacement velocity acceleration we're going to meet other concepts forces momentum um, angular motion meaning angular displacement velocities acceleration momentum that's to do with like turning motion um, object sitting on a spot but turning at a certain rate or by a certain amount also represented by, by vectors this angular momentum uh, but there are many more in physics so there are things you might meet down the line um, are fields and these could be electric fields or magnetic fields or gravitational fields um, or if you keep going certain other fields They're also, if you really keep going with physics, you might, might meet um, what you might call quantum states and quantum theory. They are also ultimately represented by vectors um, in a much more abstract sense. But they live in a very different sort of space again. But the list goes on. So no matter how advanced you get in your physics, right, this is stuff you're not going to get to in this course because you do this, you know, and maybe you're... Um, second or third year at, at being a physics major you would 
we're still going to need them, right? They live everywhere. Vectors are absolutely um, everywhere. So let's get a grip on, on how they work. Let's give some examples, actually, from this list down here. So a displacement, right? So I can say, for example, for example, um, 5 miles south. Right, that would be a vector. I've specified a vector in words, five miles south, but I give me a displacement, a magnitude, and a direction. Um, or say, take a velocity. Maybe for velocity, I might say something like um, 600 miles per hour at 30 degrees south of west. So maybe it might be the velocity vector of a plane, right? 600 miles per hour, that's the speed, that's the magnitude, and then the direction given by this. Um, an acceleration, let's think of an example here. Uh, I mean, one, one we've met here would be the um, acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, but that's, that's just the magnitude. The actual acceleration is straight down. Right, gravity pulls you down. It's often it's implicit, right? We didn't mention it every time, but it, we've always taken the acceleration to gravity to be down. We knew which way it was, and it matters. Um, forces we haven't talked about forces yet, but we can nonetheless come up with an example. And uh, maybe we we'll just describe it. We might say a force equal to. the weight um, of 90 elephants. Right, so just saying this is specifying a, specifying a vector. Oops, you have to say which direction. Um, maybe let's say, let's say straight down. I don't know where that would be relevant. Maybe if you talk about the force, you know, on a submarine due to the water above when the submarine is deep down the water and the water pressure is really high, something like that, right? Uh, doesn't matter. But these are all ways of specifying vectors. They're not really sort of systematic, mathematical ways, but it's fully specified what the magnitude and what the direction is. And if I wanted to draw them, I can draw all of them too. In this case, I might draw five miles south. I might draw like this, um, where here I'm imagining I'm, this is five miles long. It doesn't have to be literally five miles long, but this length on the paper is representing five miles. Um, and straight south, of course, I'm assuming I'm having a sort of top-down view here, so that this is south. Similarly, I might draw this one south of west. West is this way. South of west is this way. It might look something like this, where this length represents, not a distance, it doesn't represent 600 miles. It represents the velocity of 600 miles per hour, also express it you know, in other units such as meters per second. That'd be slightly under 300, I think. Um, this one, again, I'd probably just go straight straight down, but the view would be like from the sort of side, not top down, right? Here, like south is not down. Sounds obvious, but I've seen mistakes happen. Um, and, and similarly here, right? So you represent, you can draw it just with an arrow and it becomes meaningful if you've got more than one vector you can compare them by looking at the length and direction a little bit what we did in the previous lecture when we had just velocity vectors to worry about so now what's going to be important for actually um, dealing with those vectors is that we're able to decompose them into um, components so let me let me draw let me draw a vector. So let me take um, a vector like this. Let me make it 600 units long. Not too worried about what it is right now. And let's say this is 30 degrees. Now the vector itself is represented by this arrow and it doesn't care how I describe it. But I need to describe it somehow and right now I have it as 30 degrees from the horizontal on my page. But maybe I want to describe it in a coordinate system. 
So maybe this is some kind of displacement or some kind of velocity on, um, on Earth. I mean, I suppose, I suppose this is actually, if we, if we would point the other way around, I mean, it would be our plane. Let's just go with that, miles per hour, right? So let's say our plane has gone south um, west, and now it's going back to where it originally came from, 600 miles per hour. So I have to choose a coordinate system to describe this vector numerically in some sense. So maybe I'll do something sensible here, and I say, okay, well, I've got north, south, west, east. So I'm going to make my coordinate system have a west-east direction, and maybe let me call this x, and it has a north-south direction, or I'll call this y. So I now want the x and y component of this vector. The way I do this is that I essentially split the vector, the arrow, into how much is it taking me sideways, how much is it taking me up. Right? So this part here would be the y component. And it's not a y component because it's vertical on the page, it's the y component because I chose my y axis to be vertically on the page. Something we often do, but you can pick other coordinate systems, and indeed we'll do so occasionally. Um, this would be the x component, because it's in the x direction. Let's give this vector a name, just to make our life a little bit simpler. I want to call it u. And often we write vectors with a little arrow on top. Um, other notations you might see, so there's, there's this here. There's, when it's printed, sometimes you see it being printed in bold, it's hard to do on the page, so we don't do it when it's um, when we hand, hand write. Or sometimes when it's handwritten, you see it like with an underline. I haven't seen this recently a lot. Um, I think this maybe this sort of fallen out of fashion a bit. Maybe it's particularly common in the British school system, but not so much um, in America. Not entirely sure. Um, I like to go with this one because it says, look, it has a direction, a little arrow. It's, it's obvious, it's unambiguous. There's a different way of ways of writing the same writing the same thing. So let's find the two components. Now, because I've called my vector u, I might call this here u subscript y and this one u subscript x. Notice that x and the x and y components they are not vectors in themselves, right? They are just numbers that together uniquely define what that vector is. So they don't get little arrows. Um, but then, not, as a matter of notation, I can write my vector u consists of an x component and a y component. And then I can write it like this, for example. If this were a vector in three-dimensional space, so north, south, west, east, and also sort of coming out of the page towards us, right, it's hard to draw, um, then I give it a z component or z component as well. Sometimes you can see sort of people trying to draw 3D like this, x, y, z, where this is meant to be a right angle, and this is a right angle, and then this is also a right angle, if you use three right angles. I mean, you can see it, hopefully, but as soon as you try to draw like vectors and arrows in it, it becomes hard to see what's going on. So, you know, where we can, we're going to stick with two dimensions. It's because it's, we can draw it on the page. So, two components. I can write it like this. Sometimes you also see that written like this. With an I, with a hat on top, plus U, Y, with a, and a J on top. The, the the hats mean unit vector, which means they have exactly length 1, and then i is supposed to be a vector that, that goes essentially like this, 1 in the x direction, and this one is a vector that goes straight in the y direction, right, of length 1, um, and then you add, well, how much do I have of this one, how much do I have that one? Sort of a roundabout way of writing it. It sometimes can be appealing. I don't use it very often. Um, I like this one better. I think it's a bit neater. But again, there are different ways of how you might encounter um, vectors being, being spelled out. 
Let's go to our example and actually find what the components are. To do that, we're just going to use trigonometry. Because the x and the y axis, they're perpendicular to each other, that means you're always going to have right angle triangles when you're dealing with vectors. Right? And so we'll be able to take the components. Um, the x in this case is the adjacent to this angle. That's not always the case, depending what angle you've got. Right? If we had this angle, then the x component would be the opposite. We might have to find our axes differently. So don't make assumptions. X does not mean use cosine. Right? Look at the geometry. Which one is the adjacent? Which one's the opposite of the angle that you have? So you X in this case is going to be uh, 600 miles per hour times it's adjacent to this cosine um, of 30 degrees and now I have to go out on a limb here, and I think that comes to around 520 when we work it out, miles per hour. Right, so the components have the same units as the, the vector itself. Because cosine just is a number. Um, and then the, the y component is going to be 600 miles per hour, right, that's the hypotenuse times sine of 30. Sine of 30 is just a half, so that's easy. That's going to be 300 miles per hour. So if I just worry about how far am I drifting, drifting right, well then I can just worry about this one. How far am I going north, well then I can just, sorry, other way around. How far am I drifting right, I just worry about this one. How far am I going north or south, well that's what this one is about. Okay, so we'll need a lot of trigonometry. Make sure you're on top of your sines, cosines, and tans um, at the very least. So let, let's work differently. Let's do another example. Let's do the following example. Suppose I give you another vector. Um, let me call that vector k. Why not? And call it whatever we, we, we like. And let's say it's given by... Oops, given by this. This is the vector. No units in this case, it's just, you know, this, this defines the vector. So what is the direction? And what is the magnitude? Well, let's draw it. Um, so x component, y component. Now, which way is that? Well, it has to be defined. These values are defined with respect to some given coordinate system. If that's that's not the case, then it's sort of physically meaningless, at least. So x, y, um, and then we're going to draw it. 6, so this is the x component. So I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, take me to here, and then I go up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, it takes me to here. So it's going to look something like this. So slightly more up than, than right. Of course, if, my, if, if this has some physical meaning and my axes are you know, pointing in some other direction, well, then the vector would too point in a different direction. But this is my, my vector k, and this, this would be the y component here, and this would be the x component here. Because I can also draw them here or here. It doesn't matter where I draw them horizontal part, vertical part. So to find the, the magnitude, maybe the easier thing, the magnitude is going to be um, k, and I write that as the absolute value of the vector k. The same way you take the absolute value of a negative number and you just get the you know, numerical value without the minus sign, like absolute value of minus 5 is 5. Um, this denotes just the magnitude of the vector, means the length, right? The length, length that could represent a velocity, a force, acceleration, um, or whatever, but it, it sort of throws out the direction. And so this we're going to get, by right, just working this out, this, you're going to use the, the triangle, you're going to have 6 squared plus 8 squared, take the square root, right? Pythagoras again, it's the square root of 100, uh, 36 plus 64, which comes to 10. What about the direction? Well, we specified it, I guess, with an angle. So what's this angle here? Let's give it a name. Um, let's call it, I call it 
call it eta, right? So eta and the standard Greek letter, I had to pick one. Um, so I labeled it there. So eta is going to be, well, I've got all sides of the triangle, 6, 8, and 10. So can you use any two? We, maybe take the two that I was given, so this and this one. Um, so eta is going to be the, the tan of eta is going to be opposite over adjacent, so that's 8 over 6, and so that means eta is the inverse tan or arc tan of 8 over 6. Um, I have no clue what that is, so I'm just going to leave it like this. That's totally fine. You know, you can plug it in your calculator um, if you really can't live with leaving it like this. Sometimes, in some contexts, you might see the magnitude of a vector um, just written as, so not written like this, it might also be written as just k without the arrow on top. Um, I mean, there definitely are contexts where that is common and makes life easy because writing this is long, but I'd advise you not to do it right now just because it makes it confusing. Well, it's easy to forget the arrow sometimes when you write down some math. So I'm just having this as a separate symbol can be a bit can be a bit confusing. It is sometimes done and it's totally fine, but only if you do it only if you're really like confident in your um in your math and working with vectors. Okay, let's do another example. The example I want to do now is finding a vector in expressing the same vector in different coordinate systems. So let's do this. Let's have the following. Let's imagine I've got some kind of ramp like this. Let me take another um, fairly straightforward angle. Let's go with 30 degrees again. And I imagine maybe there's a car, a cart or something, a toy car. It's rolling down this ramp and it's doing so at a constant speed. Um, v that's equal to 5 meters per second. Right, this is my speed, and then this is the actual vector V that's represented by this arrow. Its magnitude right, is 5 meters per second. And the direction is, of course, straight down the ramp. So what are the components of this vectors? Well, we have to pick a coordinate system. So I'll we have choices here, and these are both, we're going to make two different choices, and both are choices we're going to need for applications later later on. So the simplest one, right, is that I say, hey, I'm just going to um, pick my x-axis to be this way, my y-axis to be this way. I don't really care where I put the origin right now, because I'm just representing the velocity, right, not the position relative to some the origin. The direction, though, is important. So in that case, well, there's a component that's, that's that's vertical and a component that's horizontal. So makes a V in the X direction, that's to the right. That's going to be, well, let's have a look. If this is 30, then I could also um, make this thing bigger. Let's say this represents that vector again. Then this thing is also a 30. Right, so my x component would be this, or I, there I drew it down here, that's fine too. Um, my y component might be this. Of course, I could also draw it over here. x component down here, that's all fine. Um, but so 30 degrees right here. So that implies vx is going to be 5, that's this, cosine 30 degrees. Um, what does that come to? 5 times cosine of 30 degrees, about 4.33. Of course, this is meters per second, so this should also be meters per second. I didn't forget to write there. I can write it back here. That's fine. And meters per second. And then the y component is going to be this one here, or I can use this one here, or this is 30. doesn't matter how I'm going to do it. And it's the opposite of this one, so Vy is equal to 5 meters per second times sine of 30 degrees, which comes to sine of 30 is a half, 
meters per second. Right? So the car is losing altitude at a rate of five of 2.5 meters per second. That's what I've worked out here. Now I might have chosen a different coordinate system. I might have chosen a coordinate system where I say, hey, why not make my x-axis, my x ruler, point down the hill? And I can have my y ruler, if I need it at all, point sort of perpendicular to it, like sticking out of the hill. And we're going to need that later, especially when we talk about forces. Um, how about this coordinate system here? Well, first of all, it's going to be confusing if I also call those x and y, if I have those x and y's already on the page. So one trick we often see is that we just relabel them a little bit. We say, maybe call this x bar and y bar. So I put a little bar on top, and that means not an arrow, right? just a bar. Um, and that makes it like a different symbol. It's kind of a physicist thing to do that I put bars and primes and, and tildes on top, little twiddles. Um, or you could call it like x twiddle. And then it's a new variable. It's just I'm so used to calling directions x and y that even when I have to have a second set of directions, I don't want to call it something else. Um, so I just call it x bar. It's sort of a physicist thing to do. You could call them, you know, um, Jim and Tony. It's fine too. But but this is sort of what physicists like to do. They like to keep things close to home, and close to home is using x and y. Um, so we call them x bar and y bar, and then I get v in the x bar direction is it's just 5 because it's going in the x bar direction and v in the y bar direction well y, y bar is how is it going up and down out of the hill or into the hill well, that is 0 because it's not doing that at all right so I chose my coordinate system in a smart way so that the motion the vector is represented um, in this very simple form so I've got those two ways of writing it. In this case, I'd write it as 4.33 and 2.5 meters per second. Here I'd write it as 5 and 0 meters per second. And those two are the same vector, right? They represent one and the same vector. They just chose different coordinate systems to do so. We might say in math speak, they chose different bases. A basis for a coordinate system is like saying, what are my axes? What are my axes? Or a basis for a vector space, um, if I want to be more careful. Okay, so same vector expressed differently. More often than not, you're not going to change coordinate system halfway through a question. But what you might do is the beginning of a problem, you might be like, okay, what coordinate system should I use to make my life simpler? And if I'm dealing with the velocity down here, well, maybe I want to choose this one because, hey, that vector looks a lot simpler than this one does. Okay, so we talked about components. Let's figure out how to add two vectors. And we already did that a little bit when we were talking about the boat crossing the river. Right. So let's do, um, let's do some more of this. So, so graphically, meaning arrows, this, let's use this buzz phrase, um, let's call it tip to tail. It's easy to remember, because it, it's an alliteration, tip to tail, right? So can't forget. So if I have this, say I've got a vector A, and they want to add to it a vector B, and let's say B looks like this. Remember, vectors don't live in space, right? This one doesn't live here, and this one lives over here, different part of the page. They just have a length and a direction. That's all there is to them. There's no location to them. Then they make a new vector that I can call A plus B. Of course, I can give it them a new name too. And the way I do this is I take A and I stick B right for the end, I guess B should be going down a little bit. Right, it's going down a bit. So I just, it's almost like I'm grabbing B and I'm moving it without turning it. And then the overall vector I'm going to get is this one here from the very beginning to the very end. So this would be my vector A plus B. Right, so write it down here. 
So I put them together by sticking the, the tip of the one to the tail of the other, the tip of the one to the tail of the other, without rotating them in any way, and that gives me the combined vector. Okay. Now what's one thing to note is that if I were to add them the other way around, so I take the same two vectors, of course I'm not being very careful right now, I'm just sort of eyeballing it, so I, but I add them the other way, and what I get would be, this is my B, this is my A, and so the overall vector like this, B plus A, is exactly the same as a plus b, right? Because this here is the same direction, same length as this one. I haven't proved it to you, um, but we can check it. And in the um, in the where I posted a link to this video, you should also find a link to a little simulation that you can use to play around with vectors and different values and so on to get a better feel for them. So let's let's actually work an example um, where we're going to be more careful, and to do that we're going to add vectors algebraically, and to do that we add them component by component. I'll show you what that means. Algebraically, do it component by component, or component wise. It's another fancy way of saying that same thing. Um, what it means is we're going to add the x component of one to the x component of the other to make the x component of the, the final answer. So let's let's be specific. Let's take two vectors. Um, I'm going to take my a to be, let's make it perfectly flat now. Um, a is this, and I'm going to say it's five, and then I'm going to add to it my vector b, and I'm going to make b this time stick up like that. Um, Actually, we make it a bit steeper, just to be easier to draw down the line. Steeper like this. And I'm also make, going to make B a bit longer. So let's go up to here. Let's say B has length 10. Don't care about the units right now. Um, and the angle, I'm going to go with 53.13 degrees. You might ask, well, it's a funky angle. Why that one? Turns out that it has nice sine and cosine values. So let's add those. And let's say um, I'm going to have C, and we call the vector C A plus B, so I don't have to write A plus B all the time. So component wise means C um, X is going to be A X plus B X. And cy, the y component of the combined vector c, is ay plus by. I could also write it as the vector c is um, a plus b. So this is kind of a shorthand. Those two together, um, I can write just like this, like literally adding the vectors. So this addition sign is an operation now not between numbers but between vectors that's defined via the components. Um, that sounds crazy in a way, like, but we, we have to redefine addition here, right? Because addition is defined for numbers. Vectors are not numbers, they are numbers in a direction. So how do I do that? So we are, this is really what redefines what addition means for vectors. If you, if you have written any code, if you're a programmer, um, that will sound very familiar. If not, you might have to pause and think for a moment um, what, we are, what we're doing here, why we have to sort of reinvent what addition means in an obvious way, but it, it's still a new operation because we're not adding numbers, we're adding vectors. Um, so I might also write this as another way to write it. I could write it as CX, CY in this vector form is equal to AX, AY, plus b x b y so it doesn't matter what way you like best right um, ultimately we have to somehow evaluate it either this way or this way and then we're adding it component by component so the x adds the x so i can write this as a x plus 
plus bx and ay plus by. So don't be confused. Two vectors get added. Here I'm saying I'm the top component of the final vector is the sum of the top components. The bottom component of the final vector is the sum of the two bottom components. Um, so I can now, now work this out. So I need to find the components of a and b. Well, let's do this. ax is zero. Oops. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't actually picked my coordinate system, right? Let's do that. That's the obvious thing. x, y. Then ax is five and ay is zero, right? Because it's five to the right in the x direction. Over here we have ax, oops, bx, excuse me, is 10 cosine 53.13. Which I think is 53 cosine of 53.13 is is 0.6, so this is 6, and then by is 10 sine 53.13, which turns out to be exactly 8, which is why I chose this funny angle for this problem, so we keep our numbers nice and clean. So that means what we're going to get is we plug those in, and we get 5 plus 6 on top. And on the bottom we get 0 plus 8, so our final vector c is given by 11, 8. Let's draw this. Right. So, so we have our final vector 11, 8. So I want to go 11 across, and I should be straight, 8 up. The vector might look something like this. Not a, I'm, I'm just eyeballing it pretty badly here. It looks something like this. Where it came from adding this to this, right? So it came from adding um, A to B like this, and the resulting thing is it's this vector over all, and we found its component by adding them component wise, like we did up here. So we found we found our final vector. Um, maybe we want to express this vector in terms of magnitude and direction, right? So we have the component, this is the x component of c, the y component of c, c being the final vector that we want by adding the other two. Well, if we want the magnitude, the magnitude is just going to be 11 squared plus 8 squared, take the square root. What is that? 121 plus 64, 185, um, and I think that is 13.6, yeah, about, uh, and then that is the magnitude, we need direction, direction, well, how do we specify that, probably as an angle, I'm going to pick this angle here from the, from angle from the x direction, right? Angle, let's give it a name, let's call it gamma, why gamma? Well, the Greek alphabet goes alpha, beta, gamma, and uh, we went A, B, C, so A goes with alpha, B goes with beta, C goes with gamma, even though it's no longer like the letter corresponding to C, but um, so zeta gets confused with xi a lot because with C, because you know, people don't know Greek. Um, so I'm going to call it gamma. And then how are we going to find this? Well, I have this triangle here. Ignore the green ones, right? 8, 11. Let's, let's do that. So, so gamma is going to be the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent 8 over 11, um, which is approximately, I think, 36 degrees thereabouts. Because I could have taken the cosine of 11 over 13.6 should get me to the same answer. Okay, so for now that's all we're going to need with vectors. We need to be able to take components, magnitudes, add them, subtract them. It should be fairly obvious how to subtract them and let you think about that. Um, and and that's it. That's all we're going to need for now. There are other things you can do with vectors um, and we're going to need some of those later in this course or maybe a later course, some cool things to do it's what's called the vector dot product. 
So it's a way to multiply vectors. Um, there's also something called a vector cross product that plays a role in rotational mechanics, where things are spinning, and in magnetism. And it's a different way to multiply two vectors. So there you see how this, we have to define mathematical operation in new comes in the different ways of taking products of vectors. Um, one thing we haven't done here, which you probably should have done actually, and this was an omission on my part, is to say, well, can I multiply a vector by a number? You can. Um, but what happens when I take two times a? Well, I just add a to a itself, right? So, but let's just actually add this for completeness. That's the final thing, and I should have had this earlier. Multiplying a vector by a number. Well, if I have 3 times a, it's going to, it's equal to 3 times the x component, the y component, which I can write as 3ax and 3ay. So the obvious way, it just makes every component 3 times as long. If I have 0 0.2 times v, well, that means I'm going to end up with each component getting multiplied by by a point 0.2, so I get 0 0.2 vx, 0 0.2 vy, whatever that is. The result being that that changes the magnitude by the number you're multiplying, so it's going to be 0 0.2 times as long as before, but it does not change the direction. Again, I want you to think about why it doesn't, um, but it has to do with the ratios of the sides still being the same. The ratios of the components are still the same, so all the angles are still the same, only the overall scale has changed. So this is, it is super intuitive, uh, but for completeness we should have it here, and the rest of it is just applying it. And we're going to need it a lot, so we better get good at these basic things that we can do with vectors. These ones we're going to come back to um, later on. Thanks for watching.